So far we've talked about chemicals, cells, and tissues working our way through the organizational levels of life. We're now ready to talk about organs and our first organ system. Body membranes function to cover surfaces, line cavities, and protect underlying structures. Body membranes are simple organs. They're composed of two tissue types. That is a basic organ. An organ is composed of two or more tissue types that have a similar function. There are two basic membrane types. Epithelial membranes are true organs. They have two different tissue types, an epithelial tissue layer and a connective tissue layer. Connective tissue membranes are made only of connective tissue, but there are two different types of connective tissue. There are three types of epithelial membranes, cutaneous, mucus, and serous. The cutaneous membrane is the skin. Because the skin is exposed to air, we say it is a dry membrane. The skin is made of stratified squamous epithelium, that's the epithelial layer, and dense irregular connective tissue, that's the connective tissue layer. Now the squamous cells become keratinized as part of their development process. This simply means they get a heavy protein coat that makes them waterproof. Mucous membranes line cavities that have a natural opening to the outside. These are made of epithelium and some sort of loose connective tissue. It will vary depending upon the type of mucous membrane. The epithelial cells are capable of secreting mucus. This keeps these membranes moist so they are known as wet membranes. Mucous membranes line the digestive tract, the urinary tract, the respiratory tract, and the reproductive tracts. Serous membranes line cavities that do not have a natural opening to the outside. They're composed of a simple squamous epithelium on top of an areolar connective tissue. Because these cavities have no natural opening, the membrane covers the organs and also lines the cavity. The visceral layer is the layer that covers the organs in the cavity. The parietal layer lines the cavity. There is space between the two layers and this is filled with serous fluid. The serous fluid acts as a lubricant so that the organs can slide across each other and on the cavity wall without any friction. There are three serous membranes, the peritoneum, the pleura, and the pericardium. The pleura is the one that lines the thoracic cavity or the chest cavity. So its parietal layer is against the wall of the chest cavity and its visceral layer comes around and covers the lungs. The peritoneum lines the abdominal cavity. So its parietal layer is against the abdominal wall and its visceral layer goes around all of the abdominal organs, the digestive organs. And the pericardium covers the heart. Now even though the heart is in the thoracic cavity, it has its own separate little bag that surrounds it. So there is a visceral and parietal pericardium. In the space here will be serous fluids that will allow these organs to move smoothly against the walls of the cavity and over each other if they need to. The connective tissue membranes are the synovial membranes. These membranes line the fibrous capsules that are around the movable joints. They're composed of soft areolar connective tissue. There is no epithelial tissue involved in a connective tissue membrane. The synovial membranes can also secrete a lubricant known as synovial fluid. This makes the joints move more easily. Connective tissue membranes can also wrap around tendons and make little sacs that can act like ball bearings around the joints. These sacs are known as bursa. Here you see some different kinds of synovial membrane structures. This is a tendon sheath wrapped around the tendon to protect it as it goes across this bone. This is a bursa, a little fluid filled sac. This particular tendon crosses this bone, and without this little ball bearing, it might bind up every once in a while. And then here is the kind of synovial membrane that is lining the joint. The first system we're going to talk about is the integumentary system. Systems, remember, are made of groups of organs. So we have the skin, the various glands of the skin, the sensory receptors, the nails, and the hair. These are all the organs of the integumentary system. The integumentary system has several functions. Primarily, it protects. It provides both mechanical and chemical protection, as well as thermal protection, and it protects us from ultraviolet light or sunlight. The skin aids in body temperature regulation, it synthesizes vitamin D, and it houses sensory receptors that allow us to pick up important messages from the external environment. 
There are two basic layers to the skin, the epidermis, which is the epithelial layer, and the dermis, which is the connective tissue layer. The epidermis is the top layer. It replaces itself every 25 to 45 days. There are several different kinds of cells in the epidermis, but the primary ones are the keratinocytes. These are the most numerous cells. They produce a protein known as keratin. This makes the cell very tough and waterproof and adds to the protective function of the skin. Melanocytes produce melanin. This is a protein that's brown in color. When it collects in certain spots, you have freckles or moles if it's in a concentrated area. But melanin acts as the natural sunscreen. This helps protect the DNA of the skin cells from ultraviolet light damage. And then there are the Langerhan cells. These migrate around under the skin and help pick up bacteria that may be trying to invade deeper in the body. So they're involved in immunity. There are five different layers to the epidermis, but there's only two we're going to talk about. The one closest to the dermis, the innermost layer, is known as stratum basale or the stratum germinativum. This gets the most nutrition. The cells here divide the most actively. As they make new cells, they push the new cells up to the surface. As these cells are moving up toward the surface, they get more and more keratin in them until finally when they are in the last two layers of the skin, they are really dead. They are so keratinized that they can't receive nutrition. The outermost layer is the stratum corneum. Now this is 20 to 30 cell layers thick and all of these cells are dead, but they're very protective. The fact that they're dead mean that they slough off pretty easily, and this helps protect us from abrasive kinds of damages. The other layer of the skin is the dermis. The dermis literally holds the body together. It's made of dense, irregular connective tissue. That means there are lots and lots of collagen fibers, all kind of bundled at different angles. So we have a lot of flexibility, we have a lot of stretch, and we have a very tough tissue here. There are two regions of the dermis. The outermost layer is the papillary layer. This supplies nutrients for the epidermis and also has the ridges that we see on the hands and the feet as fingerprints. These ridges are known as the dermal papilla. You'll remember that epithelial tissue is avascular, so this is the layer of the connective tissue that feeds the epidermis. The other layer of the dermis is the reticular layer. Now this has a lot of collagen fibers in it. This is where most of the organs are found, the blood vessels, the sweat and oil glands, and the various pressure receptors. If there is prolonged pressure on the dermis, the blood supply to the dermis can be cut off and the cells in the dermis will die. This is what happens when someone lays in one spot too long. The bones that are under the dermis will put prolonged pressure on a certain area of the dermis, cutting off the blood supply. Bed sores result because of this degradation of tissue. Bed sores really start on the inside and work their way out. So here is a picture of the dermis of the skin. Here is the stratum basale, that actively dividing layer, and this is the layer where we have the uh, melanocytes and the actively dividing cells. And this is the stratum corneum. In between there are two other layers. Here in the stratum spinosum the cells can still divide but they're beginning to get a lot of keratin in them. By the time we get into this layer there are many many keratin granules and these cells are pretty far away from their nutrition source as well as fairly waterproof. So these cells begin to die and then these cells, the stratum corneum, are dead. They're fully keratinized. They're tough little cells that easily flake off. Melanocytes here in the stratum basale, and here is a Langerhans cell. It can kind of migrate around between the cells and pick up any bacteria that may have wiggled in this far. This is an actual picture of one. Here is the stratum corneum. Here is the stratum basale. These are the actively dividing cells. A couple of things can happen on the surface of the skin. If there is friction, a blister may form. This simply is because the epidermis is pulled away from the dermis and fluid collects between the epidermis and the dermis. Stretch marks occur if the skin tries to grow too fast. The dermis may tear and the tear fills in with scar tissue. Scar tissue is white, so rapid stretching of the dermis can cause stretch marks to occur. Skin color is determined by three major things. 
Melanin is one of the things. Melanin is the brown pigment made by the melanocytes, and this is the primary determinant of your skin color. Everyone has the same number of melanocytes, but melanocytes will produce different levels of melanin. This is genetically controlled. Occasionally, people will pick up a little bit of an orange tint to them. This is from food. This is from carotene, which is the orange pigment that makes carrots and sweet potatoes so orange. In adults, you don't see a lot of keratin discoloration of the skin, but babies have very, very thin skin. And if they eat a lot of carrots or sweet potatoes or some sort of orange vegetable, the next day they may look slightly orange. Then we have that blood supply in the dermis. Oxygen-rich blood is nice and red, and a little bit of that pinkness will come through the epidermis, giving a little bit of pink color to the skin. There are some abnormal skin colors that can indicate diseases going on. If the skin is unusually red, this means that there is an increased blood supply to the dermis. This can happen in fever, in hypertension, or if there is an inflammatory response going on. Jaundice is a yellow discoloration of the skin. This is when hemoglobin is not properly broken down by the liver and a yellow byproduct known as bilirubin circulates in the blood. So jaundice indicates some sort of liver disorder. Bruises are known as hematomas. With a bruise, some of the capillaries under the skin were ruptured and blood escapes into the tissue. As the hemoglobin goes through its breakdown process, we first get sort of a greenish color, and then it fades to a yellow color, that bilirubin. Eventually, it goes away completely. Cyanosis is a blue discoloration of the skin. This is usually most noted around the lips and in the nail beds. Cyanosis means that there is an inadequate oxygen supply in the blood. Skin derivatives, or some of those other structures in the skin, include the various cutaneous glands. These glands are exocrine glands, which simply means that they release their secretions through ducts to some surface. Sebaceous glands are oil glands. They're found all over the body except on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. The ducts usually empty directly into hair follicles. The sebaceous glands produce sebum, that is their secretion. Sebum is simply oil. This acts as a lubricant to keep those dead skin cells somewhat pliable and to keep your hair somewhat pliable. Your hair is a bunch of dead cells as well. Sebum also has some antibacterial properties that helps keep the number of bacteria on the skin down to an acceptable number. The sudoriferous glands are the sweat glands. There are about 2.5 million sweat glands per person and they're pretty evenly distributed around the body. They produce sweat, which is mostly water. Sweat glands help us cool off. When we sweat and that sweat evaporates, that's going to cool the body down. Hair is another skin derivative made of tough keratinized cells. The root of the hair is in the follicle, which is sort of a sheath that protects the root. And the dividing cells are in the base of the follicle, down here in the root. The rest of the shaft, all of this that is exposed, is dead cells, just like the stratum corneum of the skin. These cells are dead. So basically, living cells here get keratinized, and as they're pushed up, they become more and more dead until they're dead when they come out here. The pigment of the hair is the result of pigment made by the melanocytes. Attached to each hair follicle is a smooth muscle. This is known as the erector pili muscle. This is a smooth muscle. You have no control over it, but your sympathetic nervous system does. When you are cold or when you are frightened, this muscle contracts and it will pull the hair follicle up against the skin, making a bump here, what we call goosebumps. Because muscle contraction leads to heat, doing this when you're cold generates just a little bit of heat. Your hair functions in protection. It keeps you warm, which keeps you from losing heat. Most animals have hair covering their body. Humans typically only have most of their hair on their head. Here is a drawing of a section of skin, so we can see all of these parts. Here's the epidermis and the dermis. Here's that ridge-like papillary layer of the dermis. We have our hair shafts and hair follicles. The oil glands will empty their oil primarily into hair shafts. We have sweat glands that coil and come up to the surface of the skin in these pores so that we can sweat through these pores. And some of the receptors we have are pressure receptors here, Meissner's corpuscle, 
Bassinian's corpuscle. These are ways that we can get information about the outside. Notice that the epidermis is avascular, no blood vessels, but lots of blood vessels here in the dermis that will supply nutrition, particularly to this stratum germinativum, this actively dividing layer of cells. Another skin derivative are the nails. Again, we have cells that have been toughened by keratin. The free edge is the visible portion of the nail. The root is embedded back in the dermis, and this is where the actively dividing cells are located. Nails give us some protection on the ends of our fingers and the ends of our toes, and you also have a tendency to use your nails as little tools. You scrape with them. You may have even used them as a screwdriver at some time. One of the homeostatic skin imbalances is burns. Burns are caused as the result of chemical, electrical, or heat damage to the skin. In first degree burns, only the epidermis is damaged. The skin appears red. In second degree burns, the epidermis and the upper part of the dermis are injured. Here the epidermis will separate from the dermis and fluid will collect between the two, so you have blistering. In third degree burns, the entire thickness is destroyed. Now first and second degree burns are painful, but third degree burns are not painful. All of the pain receptors in the dermis have been destroyed, so there is no way to pick up pain. Burns are a problem because dehydration can occur. Remember, your skin is a waterproof layer. Not only does it keep stuff out, but it also keeps stuff in. So if you lose that waterproof layer, you evaporate away. Also, skin is your barrier that protects you from bacteria coming in. With that barrier gone, you're much more susceptible to infection. Another homeostatic imbalance of the skin is skin cancer. There are certain predisposing factors. One is ultraviolet light exposure. Chemical or physical trauma can predispose you to skin cancer, as can some infections, and heredity. When you're looking at structures that you think might be skin cancers, you can evaluate them using the ABCD rule. A is asymmetry. With asymmetry, the two sides don't match. You have irregularities. You look at the border. B stands for border. The border of most of your moles and pigmented areas are usually pretty smooth, no indentations or rough spots. Then you look at color. Typically your color is a uniform brown color, but if you start seeing darker spots or even some blues or reds in there, that can be an indication that something is wrong. And finally you look at diameter. It shouldn't be more than 6 millimeters in diameter. That's about the diameter of a pencil eraser, so a pencil eraser is a good guide to use. There are three types of skin cancer. Basal cell carcinoma has about a 99% recovery rate. This is the least malignant and most common skin cancer. What happens in basal cell carcinoma is the stratum basale cells, the basal cells, begin to divide and invade the dermis. Instead of sending the cells up toward the surface, it sends them into the dermis. This leads to a raised bump on the surface of the skin. Squamous cell carcinoma arises from cells in the second layer of the skin, the stratum spinosum. These cells are still capable of cell division. Any cell that can divide is a potential cancer cell. Squamous cell carcinoma tends to appear on the scalp, the hands, and the lower lip as sort of a scaly lesion. These can grow rapidly. They metastasize sort of moderately. Some of them do, some of them don't. Malignant melanoma has a 50% fatality rate. This arises from accumulated DNA damage to the skin, usually from exposure to ultraviolet light. Malignant melanomas metastasize rapidly, which is why the fatality rate is so high. So here you see a basal cell carcinoma, that raised bump. Here in the scalp, you see a squamous cell, kind of a flat, scaly thing. Notice that there's some different colors in this one. And this is a melanoma. Now this is a large melanoma, well over the size of a pencil eraser. Very dark, some different colors, and notice the irregular edges. This is on the inside of a big toe. 